Welcome to the teaching ministry of Calvary Chapel Corinth with Senior Pastor Charlie Villard. We're an expositional teaching church with a mission to comfort those in any affliction with the comfort in which we ourselves have been comforted by God. We're glad to have you join us today, so let's open up our Bibles and begin our verse-by-verse study in God's Word. Let's, let's begin reading. Uh, we, we wrapped up at the end of, well, near the end of chapter 22 last week in verse 37. The, the question was, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, you know, first, love God with everything you have. Second, you know, love your neighbor. And he summed up the Lord, summed up the two tablets that we were given in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments that are given are our relationship with God. And the last six of the commandments are God's commands for us and how we relate to others, right? Loving each other, um, you know, and really it's love God with everything you have and respect mankind, respect his belongings, respect his family, his wife, don't covet, don't steal, don't murder. Um, But we'll continue on in verse 41. It says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. I won't read through 23 yet. We'll just, we're going to go to Psalm 110, please. Psalm 110. This conversation that the Lord's having. So he's been questioned now. Um, you know, we've been, we've been in this for a couple of weeks, but his, re, you know, appearing in Jerusalem for the end of his life, this last sort of week, beginning with what's called Palm Sunday, you know, where he entered Jerusalem and, you know, people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, come save us. He, he begins this sort of conversation with these legal, these legal Pharisees. And they keep asking him things, and the Sadducees ask him things. And he's sort of on trial, in a sense, right? It's not an official trial yet. That will come. But they're trying to catch him in something that they can use to capture him legally so the people won't revolt, and they can try him, and ultimately their plan is to kill him. So he's sort of come to the end of this questioning session, and the Lord's smart. He's like, well, I got you here. I have a question for you. And this is sort of the nail in the coffin, ultimately. That's really not a, it, the pun wasn't intended that way, but it is that. It is, it is going to be the sort of last conversation he has in their sort of arguments. And it says, well, the Pharisees were gathered. It says, Jesus, I can imagine this is a group now, right? And he's like, hey, you know what? You've been asking me all these questions. I have a question for you. And he says, what do you think about the Christ? I mean, I wish he just said, what do you think about me, right? But He's, he's, he knows them. And he says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. They're smart men. They understand scripture, right? They have to, to know these things. They're taught it. They're, they have to be able to repeat it by their age of accountability, at least the first five books of the Bible. And so they're smart enough to say, well, he's the, he's the son of David, right? Because that was one of the things that David was promised. And if we, if we dig into Psalm 110 real quick, and he's going to quote it in, in verse 44, but Psalm 110 that David writes, in verse 1 it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies, till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion and rule in the midst of your enemies. You shall be volunteers in the day of your power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with, the, with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook of the, by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. So David's writing this. Now, David's life, you know, was a, a miraculous one. He wasn't 
anything, you know, he was a young boy, small, a runt of the family for, for that lack of a better term. But David's, the call on David's life from God would, would produce him to be a king. And, you know, the king at the time, Saul, who was a beautiful man, right? He was something to behold, but he was, he didn't walk in the ways of God. He basically turned his back on God. And God said, well, I'm going to replace you and I'll bring about a king, a humble king. And so David, um, you know, the call on David's life was to be king, but he wouldn't be king for decades because he would spend a lot of his life on the run from King Saul. But the Lord promised him in Psalm 110 that, that the the son of God, the Messiah, the one everyone's been waiting on. We've been talking about it for the last couple of weeks in Thurs- on Thursdays in Genesis, you know, with Eve waiting on, she was going to produce from her lineage, right? Which everyone comes from Adam and Eve, but she would produce the savior, the Messiah. And no doubt when she had Cain, she thought this is it, right? This is the man who will save us from all that's happened, from the mistakes that were made in the garden. And Cain would end up murdering his brother and ultimately being a vagabond. He was not the man. And Abel couldn't be because Abel was dead. Later on, Adam would have Seth. And from the line of Seth would come the Savior. But not not for thousands of years. She would live her life not seeing the Messiah, but knowing that God had promised it. And that's our lives, right? God promises things that we have yet to see fulfilled. And that's the hardest part. We long to see people we've lost. We long to see people we've read about in the Bible. When we get to heaven, we'll have these conversations. We can ask, you know, the great men of faith, women of faith that were there, like, what was it like? You know, we'll fellowship with them. But the Lord told David, even in the midst of some of the worst troubles, I, I have the hardest time reading through David's story with Bathsheba. It was such a huge fall. And a man whom was after the heart of God, Right, that he said that about David, that David would fall so greatly, but God would still use him, but it would cost him. He would, there would be consequences that he would, he would pay because of his choices. But he still said, I'm going to send you the son. So Seth would ultimately have bear the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the son of, and then David. And then David was told by God, the son of God will come through you. He'll be a son to you, not a direct, right? The son metaphorically in that respect could be generations later, which it would be. We read about that in the beginning of Matthew. So David though has this picture. Well, the son of God is also the king. So not only will he be my son, but I will serve him as king. How is it possible that a father would serve a son? It's not. Not in Jewish culture, a son, a father would never serve a son. That the son would become king possibly after the death of the father, but not, no, no father would bow to his son. And so the Lord back in Matthew, he asks them this question because they know the answer to it. No father would ever serve the son, but he says, who do you, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they're like, well, he's the son of David. And he says, okay, well, yes, yes, he is. He said, but how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? And it references that Psalm 110 we just read through. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he a son? The minds would have been blown of the Pharisees, right? They're like, uh, (laughs) They're like, I don't know, let's not say anything right now. Let's not question anything further. They're outmatched, right? They can't keep up with him. It says, no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. How is it possible? That David, because David knew who the, who the king was. David knew a relationship with God. The Pharisees don't. And that's what really we're going to dig into. And this is the conversation now that will continue with the Pharisees. They don't really know God. In verse uh, chapter 23, so spilling out of that conversation, it says, Jesus then spoke to the multitudes. We have no reason to believe that the Pharisees have left. They're still standing there. But I imagine now he turns his attention to the group that's with him. And he's like, okay, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. 
Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all of their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylac- phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teacher, teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So let's break this one down before we go really digging into this one any further. So he turns his attention from the scribes and the Pharisees, and he speaks to the people. With them standing right there. How embarrassing. You know, kids, you know what it's like, right? When your parents start talking about you and you're standing right there, you're like, I'm right here. Like, but it's meant for a purpose, right? It's meant for you to hear it so that you'll take it in and go, oh, they're talking about me, I see. But you're like, oh, this is the most embarrassing thing ever, right? It's not the heart to have. The heart to have is to hear the message, not being, oh, no, this is too much. I can't bear this. We talked about that on Thursday night. Cain was like, my punishment is too much. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. What can I do? He said, you're being unfair. That's just too much of a burden. I can't, I can't bear that. And he was just concerned about the weight of the consequences of the punishment, not, okay, I really hurt you and maybe I should just repent on this. The Pharisees won't do it either. But he says, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. This was a high place, right? Moses got the law from God. He's on the mountain. He's speaking to this burning bush. He probably looks like a crazy man. But the bush says, like, you know, watch your feet, right? Your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. I'm going to give you these things. And he, he gives him these stone tablets with God's law on them. And then Moses goes down. He sees what the people have been doing. He gets mad and he throws them and breaks them like an idiot because that's what I'd probably do. And then he has to get more tablets. The broken stone tablets would be a, a good reminder because later Moses would ultimately strike a rock when he wasn't supposed to. And it would be the last thing that God would say is, is you can no longer take the people into the promised lands. You, you're not listening to what I do. You know, what do I tell you? You're just doing whatever, and you got mad. You said something in anger, and it's going to cost you too much. So, but Moses is exalted, right? He, he was a leader for God. He saved the people. And the Pharisees look at him and his law that he was given, and now they've built this giant, they call it the Talmud, right? It's this collection of books and writings and, and theology and how to follow the law, what the law means, the, the, the little teeny nth degrees of the, of the law that they would get to. You know, when we're young, we like to argue with our parents and we like to try to argue technicalities. Well, you didn't say this exactly. You said this, but I really shouldn't be in trouble because you didn't say this, right? That's what these guys would do, right? They're like, well, you broke the law. Well, how? Well, let's go back. We'll dig into the law and we'll go through here, through here. Oh, there's not a something here? Well, we'll write it right now. And now you've broken the law. Right? So this, this Talmud is this big book of laws. And he says, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Seems like a great contradiction. He's saying, well, whatever they tell you, you should observe and do those things. He's, he's saying, what they say is important. He says, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. So he's like, listen to what they say. It's a popular phrase when I was a kid. My dad would say is, do as I say, not as I do. As Christians, that's not the way we should be, right? We should, it, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, right? Observe and do the things that I do as I follow him because I'm following Christ and you mimic that. We are, we are supposed to do that. We should find good leaders. You know, we should find people that we're willing to follow that are following Christ and mimic the things they do. They help us make good habits. But he says, he doesn't negate what they say. People will often quote, they're like, well, yeah, but Jesus came to abolish the law. No, he did not. His exact words were, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to make one last sacrifice to complete the law that we would no longer as Christians be 
bound to it, we'd be free. We'd be free of those things. We have the freedom to choose. I can go do whatever. I could go drink beer. I could, I could go to a strip joint. I could go do whatever I want. But I'm not free of the consequences of those choices or the cost that it would be, right? If you find me in a bar or Pastor Ken sees my car at a bar, walks in and I'm standing there, what do you think he's going to think? You're going to be like, dude, that's not how to behave. Who taught you? I didn't teach you this. That's not how to be doing this. Like, well, I was just in here witnessing to people. But why is there a beer half drank right in front of you? Oh, I, did, I asked him to pour half a beer so it looked like I was drinking. I, I can make up all kinds of excuses. But the fact is, is that I, I should be living my life above reproach at a place where we're sitting in a restaurant. You walk by and you're like, oh, hey, Charlie. I shouldn't have a beer half drank in front of me because you're going to go, oh, that's weird. I mean, I didn't think he drank, but whatever. But what, if a, what if a severe alcoholic who's trying to follow Christ and not drink walks by me. Well, if he can drink a beer, why can't I? Right? So he's saying, observe, listen to what they say and observe what they tell you to do and do those things. There's nothing, there's nothing bad about being holy, being righteous, not finding yourself in places you shouldn't be. But don't do as they do. He says, because for they say and do not do, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. They make this Christian walk unbearable, that no man could carry it. It's the exact opposite of what the Lord said, right? For my burden is light and my yoke is easy, or my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He's saying, I've come to bear these things for you. I've come to take these from you, cleanse you of them, so you don't carry them. Religion is what does this to people. I've seen it my whole life in my family. I've seen it with friends, right? Religion and, and tradition and like call dogma, right? These observing all of the laws to the letter or you're the worst person in the world. It's an unbearable thing to carry. Beats you down. And he says, what's interesting, he says, continuing on to four, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, right? So they tell all these people these things, but they don't carry them. They won't help you. They don't free you from the burden. My job, when you come to me and you're like, man, I, I did this and I, I can't get over it. My job isn't to make, well, yeah, you are absolutely a terrible person. You should feel terrible. You should carry the weight of this at all your rest of your life and you should feel like junk. No, my, my job is to point you to the Lord, but the Lord forgives you, right? Yes, there'll be consequences. Yes, there'll be things that happen in your life that are a result of that, and you can't get away from those. You have to bear those. But don't carry more than what's yours to carry. Don't carry the guilt of other people. Don't carry the unforgiveness of other people. The weight of all those things, why? why? That's not the life that the Lord promised us. He, he asked us to, to bring to him the things that we've done and ask for forgiveness. And when he forgives us of those, he asks us to be done with them. Why is it that as humans, we go back and we pick those things back up, and put them in our backpack and load it back on and continue carrying them if he's forgiven us? That's what the Pharisees were doing. Making sure people continue to carry those. Well, because it made them look righteous and it kept people coming back to them. Religion. In verse five, he says, but all their works, they do not, they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge their borders, their garments. What he's, what he's basically saying is, is they're making themselves look bigger and more puffed up and more grand than they're even due. And what do they do with that? He says, they, they love the best places at feasts. I think we talked about this before, but the way that the tables were, have anybody seen the Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci? Totally inaccurate and wrong altogether. It's not one long table. The Jews sat in this big U-shaped table called a triclinium. And placements in the table and the order actually had to do with, um, what's the right way to say it? It's not royalty. Um, importance. Importance. Where you sat would be in order of importance, right? If you're looking at the table, I'm, gonna have, I'm backwards from where you are, so if you're looking at the table this way, it's a big U, right? The guy who sits up on this corner, he's the lowest man on the, on, the, on the table. That's the lowest seat you can possibly take. 
man on this side up on the corner is generally the guest of honor and the person that sits next to him would be the person who threw the party. We had this conversation where they go to eat at the Last Supper, right? And Peter goes, and where does he sit? Way up at the top corner, because he values his relationship with the Lord as, I'm important, I'm going to sit next to the Lord. And the Lord humbly comes and he says, you got to move. You should never sit in the high seat, because if you have to get moved, then it's an embarrassment. If you take the lowest seat, then wherever you get moved from there is an honor. So where does he put Peter? puts him over on this side. Then on this side, who's he sit next to him? The apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved. And we were talking about a couple weeks ago. Can you imagine they were, I'm sure they were like, yeah, look at me. Oh, I'm sitting with the Lord. I'm hanging on with the Lord. And Peter's just like, come on. You know, I thought I was the greatest. So which seats do the Pharisees like? They don't take the low seat. They want the best seat in the house, right? All along this corner of this big U, right? This side, these, these are going to be the righteous places to be, the, the most important, the most honorable. That's where they like to sit. They don't come in and take the low seat. They believe they're deserving of it. So they go in and they take the high seat. So at feasts, they like to be seen. They like to be near that. Uh, the best seats in the synagogues. We're all sitting in a certain order, right? And you're looking at me, which is really weird. I would prefer I'm back there. You're still looking this direction and I'm just talking over and you're listening. So they are not looking at me. But the Pharisees, they would take this first row, right? And they would turn them around so that when when they're worshiping and they're doing the teachings and all that, you're all staring at them. So they're like, oh, look at me. I'm sitting up here in the front row. Like, look at me. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm most righteous. And you're going to go, oh, I mean, don't you do that sometimes? You look at a big crowd in a church and you're like, I don't even want to be here today. I'm not even into this. The Lord's not even working in my life. And look at that person over there. Look at their problem. They're so holy. They're standing up while everyone's sitting down. They're doing whatever. They got some great relationship with the Lord. Look at them. It's not me. I'm not, I shouldn't even be here. Right? That's, what the, that's, what, that's what the devil does. We compare ourselves against other people by the way we see them. But that's what the people were doing. The Pharisees were sitting up there saying, hey, look at us, right? We're, we're holy and righteous. I, I, would be, I would be mortified to have you looking at me while I worship. It'd be bad enough you stand next to me and hear how I sing. So they love the best seats in the synagogues, the greetings in the marketplaces. That's a weird one. You ever, you ever be walking somewhere, I don't know. The, <laughs> if you're ever somewhere where I am, you'll know this one because you will hear me. I'll be talking loud. Sheena, if we're split up somewhere and I run into somebody that I know, she'll be like, I found you because I could hear you all the way at the other end of the store. And I mean, it's, I take it as a compliment, but it's really not because other people are probably like, well, this guy is just so loud. I don't, it's just my voice. I don't do that. In, in school, I couldn't whisper. My teacher would be like, look, if you're, if you're going to talk during class, you at least need to whisper. And I'm like, I am whispering just right now. I'm whispering to you. This is as quiet as it gets. But these guys would do this intentionally. They'd walk into the, the marketplaces, hey, everyone, right? And everyone would cheer and you'd take the attention of everybody and they'd come over and they'd greet people. They want to be seen when they enter a place. If you hear me, it's because I'm talking to someone. But it's probably probably likely that they saw me and came over and talked because most of the time I try to run in and out of stores and get in and out as fast as possible while I'm not hanging out and you know I try to keep my head down I run to the shelf grab what I need run out check out people go hey Charlie and I'm like oh hey hey I'm such an introvert really like it's the I just want to get out of there and go home and you know not if I see you I want to talk with you please come up and talk to me but if you're like I don't really want to talk to anyone today. I feel introverted and there's Charlie. It's okay if you don't. I will not take offense because I'm probably in the same place going, hopefully no one will see me. I'll just go in. Now I like go, I got to buy this at Lowe's and I'll just run into the, I'll pick it up and I'll run in to get it from the service desk real quick and then I'll run in. I'll have to walk around the store or anything. But these guys, they wanted everyone to know they were there. Greetings in the marketplace and to be called by men. Rabbi, Rabbi. They liked being called rabbi, meant they were elevated, some, some status. I, <laughs> it is a blessing beyond measure for me to be pastoring. That's 
all I've wanted. I want to be involved in your life. And pastoring isn't teaching, right? There's teaching. This is what I'm doing right now. Pastoring is being involved in your lives. You have to call me at midnight because you need prayer. I want you to do that. Listen, you're not bothering me. It's the opposite of what I was just talking about at Lowe's. I want to do that for you. I want to be involved in your life. You need counsel. You need help. You're like, oh, I'm in the hospital. I need someone to pray for me. I'll drive up there. I, doesn't, I don't care where we ha- I have to go. But I would prefer you call me Charlie because the title is really, really hard to, to hear. Pastor. I, I, it really is. It's, I, didn't, I want the role, but not the title. And I know there are people here that will call me that intentionally. So it's funny. I, 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 I have to get used to it. It is what God has given me. These guys were looking for that because it elevated them above something. I'm not better than anybody. Pastor didn't elevate me anywhere. Pastor means lead slave. Right? That's what that is. I'm a slave to men. And the Lord's going to talk about this in a minute. Slave, really the operative word today would be servant. I like using slave because everyone hates that word. The connotation wasn't a negative thing. We have made it that way. And obviously, terrible hurts to the African-American American and the black community in slavery. But slave meant one who serves, right? It's who serves humbly. And then there's bond slave, which is one who chooses to continue in that role. That's who we're to be bond slaves. But anyway, that's a totally separate teaching. It says, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher. And my great, my, my pastor is Pastor Ken. But the great brother, the great shepherd, the great pastor, that's Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, that's whom I serve. He says, he who is in heaven, the father that's in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. He's saying, be careful of these things. You know, what's, when you go to work, you get your first job, and you're, oh, I don't know. I, I think of Lexi, when we were having the conversation, she's like, oh, I'm going to get a job. I want to work at Whitney's. And I was like, oh man, I worked at Hannaford when I was a kid. It was, it was a good job. Except for in the middle of the winter when I had to go collect carts. And it's snowing and there's slush everywhere. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. Or as I, I said it probably more crudely when we were having the conversation, a homeless person comes in and uses the public bathroom and decides to redecorate the bathroom on his own. And then they go, hey, yeah, can you go clean the bathroom real quick? And I'm like, oh, uh, what happened? And they're like, well, oh. It got redecorated in brown. Then you got to go in and you got to clean the bathroom. Right? Then you're like, I don't want this role. You know what I want to be? I want to be store manager or assistant manager at least. Or I don't know, head cashier or this or that. Right? I want to be elevated to a place where I don't have to do those things anymore. I had a great manager, store manager, when I worked there. One time I was that, that a similar situation happened where it was a real mess. And I was, you know, stocking some shelves and, he, you know, normally that's what I would get called to do if there was no one there late at night. And he's like, you know what? I, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I want you to keep doing that. That's important to keep doing this. I'm like, really? I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do. And he's like, nope, I got it. No one wants to do this. And he's like, but I want you to finish that. He was willing to go do the worst things. A couple of, I'm not even going to share that because it's going to sound bad when I share it. And I don't mean it'll, it'll make me sound bad. I'm willing to do anything. doesn't matter what it is. I, I, that I'm supposed to be, right? That's what we're supposed to do here. I'm willing to serve any way that I can. So he says, and whoever exalts himself in verse 12, exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So we want to have a title. We want to be exalted. Well, how do you get that? You get that by fighting or by telling somebody what to do? Or by saying, hey, I'm going to be the next door manager to the assistant manager. And like, oh, you got drive, son. I'm going to make you the assistant manager. If you come to me and say that, I'm going to make sure you never want to be manager. Because what I have to do now is humble you. And humility is a tough thing, right? Because God says here, especially, right? The Lord himself, if you want to be exalted, what do you have to be? You have to be humble. But as soon as you say, I'm humble, you're instantly not humble anymore. It's not something you can say. It's not something you can act. It's not something you can pretend to be. Well, you can try, but it'll be obvious. Humility is something in character. You you should pray for, you know, for God to give it to you. And humbling comes through pain usually. Um, I think it's Spurgeon uh, that 
quoted and said in order for God to use a man mightily, he'll have to break him greatly. Broken man becomes a humble man. Broken woman becomes a humble woman. But if you're like, oh, I am such a humble person, instantly your hum- humility is all gone because you are not humble if you have to say you're humble. So now continuing into 13, he starts to address these men. Like, continue, like now he gives eight woes. These are the opposite of the eight Beatitudes. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense of making long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. So he starts to hammer away at this stuff, right? For you shut up the kingdom of heaven. What was their job? My job is to to show you that the kingdom of heaven exists and that God loves you and wants you as part of the kingdom. I also have to tell you the hard truths on how to get there. It is not going to be a conversation, if I have to explain, that's going to be great for feelings because it's not about feelings. It's hard truths that the Lord himself said. But he says, you men that are supposed to be opening the kingdom, you're closing it off to men. You're making it not possible for them to enter. Your religious, legal ways of living your life is actually sending people to hell. Does that apply to any man-made religion today? Yes. Oh, which brings me to a quote I had that I forgot. Which, now you'll see why it reminded me of what I was talking about. Um, I found this cool quote, uh, and we're talking about titles. And uh, it, I'm, I'm a little bit delayed on it, but we'll jump me back real quick. And he says, uh, the quote, it, in reading about having titles and being seen by men and the rabbi, rabbi, right? Father, don't call a man father. Like, doesn't, he's not talking about your parent, right? That's, that's okay, they're your father. He, he's talking about something different. Father is in title, is in authority. Catholic Church, for example. What's interesting is, is that It says here, nevertheless, this command is often ignored not to take these titles and not to use them. It's um, often ignored and violated today in a way that give people that give and receive titles such as prophet, apostle, most reverend, and so on. It is also seen in the expected etiquette for closing a letter to the Pope. Here is how you're supposed to close your letter if you write. Prostrate at the feet of your holiness and imploring the favor of its apostolic benediction, I have the honor to be, very holy Father, with the deepest veneration of your holiness, the most humble and obedient servant and son slash daughter. That is how you're supposed to close the letter to the Pope. No, sincerely, Charlie. Thank you very much, Charlie. Grace and peace, Charlie. That's disgusting. That's just gross. And I... Prostrate, right? Hands and feet, all, prostrate is straight out. If you're hunting from the ground, you might find yourself in that position with a rifle, right? Laid out, looking out down the barrel. That's called prostrate. So you, the expectation is, is that when you're signing this, I'm prostrate at your feet, the feet of a man. A feet of your holiness and imploring the favor of its of its apostolic benediction. I'm appealing to your position. I have the honor to be very holy father with the deepest veneration of your holiness, the most humble and obedient servant and son and daughter. Can you imagine if I ever, ever, I mean, this likely will never happen, but can you imagine if I got invited to the, see the Pope? I would have it so jacked up. I'd be like, what's up, dude? You know, slap him on the shoulder, go in with the hug and the slap on the back. I'm not reverent of his title. I, I'm, I'm respectful of a man who's educated, right? Who's been studying. But if you've been studying all these years and you're placing burdens upon people and weight, how different are they than the Pharisees? Probably intentionally forgot that quote, so I didn't go off on that. But I, I, religion... Is gross. That's what these men are doing. They're shutting up heaven. They're keeping you out of it by their weight of their laws that they've come up with. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. Man, widows and orphans, the two most vulnerable groups of people. Widows who have lost their husbands and have no protector, and orphans who have no parent to look over them. And these men take advantage of that. And he says, and for a pretense, make long prayers. Okay, I'm way long-winded, and I know it. <laughs> During prayer meetings, you know, Ken always points out, okay, just rules for prayer. Yep, there's some rules. Pray loudly so that everyone in the room can hear you and agree with you. Don't, you know, mumble, and mutter. Trust me, there are people that do that, and you're like, I have no idea what they're saying. So I'm just going to sit here and wait for my moment to come along, and I'll try to be louder. Or don't make your prayer so long that you lose people, right? When we're all praying together, there's plenty of time, you know, say a quick prayer, another person goes, another person goes. Don't, don't do your whole entire prayer in one sitting and pray. I've, I've been in, I got the, the blessing to lead prayer meetings at times when Ken was traveling and I had a particular per, a particular person that w- would be in there here and there and I'd have to like literally start praying while they were praying. Because it'd be like six, seven minutes, you know, of a, 45, 50 minute prayer meeting, I'm like, oh my word, this person's just going to keep going. You don't have to pray for everything. And they, their prayers in particular were interesting. Um, it says, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. If you don't do your job that you've been called to, it's really not a job, it's a calling, but you are going to receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and 15 Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Oh my word. If one person comes in to this church and gets saved, but I get to disciple them and lead them to hell, man, that's the worst possible thing that could happen. Right? These Pharisees were doing that. They're making it a burden. It's not a burden. The Lord Jesus is not a burden. It doesn't mean it's not a hard life. Christian life is a tough life. It's a life of battle. 16, woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. By whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. It's a long way around saying, don't swear on anything. I swear I'll clean my room. I swear on my mother's grave or I swear on my bank account or yeah, I swear I'll do it right now or you can keep my allowance or whatever we do. He says, don't do those things. The, the Pharisees would work this in a way that would work to their legal manner, right? Well, I swore by the gold, but not by the temple. So I'm not really held and liable to my promise. No, man, you're held to your promise no matter what. You swear by the gold, but the temple sanctifies the gold. So you're swearing by the temple or swearing by your father. He says, he'll, James will go on to say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't swear anything. Just say it. Just do what you say. 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Man, the Lord is hammering this home. He says, you pay the tithe, you do these things, but then you think you're great because you've done that, right? Oh, I can't pay my tithe. I'm good, I'm safe, I'm sound, I'm gonna get into heaven. He's like, no, you, you totally miss the weightier matters of scripture justice, mercy, and faith. 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. 
Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup in the dish that the outside of it may be cleaned also. It's a metaphor. Clean the outside of the temple. I look good. I'm dressed well. I do this. I do that. And I'm, I must be good, right? People look at people and they're like, look at them. They, they must be righteous. They dress better. They do this. They have that. They look like they're holy. And he says, no, that's what you guys do. But the inside of the cup is a mess. Inside of you is, is just full of it. And he says, you'll strain out of the law a gnat, the tiny, most minute detail. But you will swallow a camel whole. You will do everything opposite of what you say. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like the whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Even so, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build up the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. This is, this is genius, right? They're going to like, oh, you know what? The prophets that were murdered before, if we were in those days, we wouldn't have done that. They did that. The Israelites are the ones that killed their own people. They did do it. They, they say something that they could never meet. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves. You are sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up, then measure out your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I sent you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteousness bloodshed, righteous bloodshed on the earth. From the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bechariah, Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. He's like, I, I know who you are. I've watched you. I sent you these people. What's he making a claim? I'm God. I am the son of God. I was there in the beginning. I am here now. And you will do these things and you will continue to do them. The whole book of Acts, that's what we're going to see. Prophets, men of God, right? Men of God spreading the gospel and what will happen? Paul himself will hunt them down and kill them and persecute them. He said, you're still going to do this. Surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Um, let's wrap. I, got, I wanted to go through this list real quick, but there are seven kinds of Pharisees. And this is according to the Talmud, this book I was talking about. The Pharisees themselves in their writings say there's seven kinds of Pharisees. I, I will find, I believe, if you, if you look at yourself in light of how good and righteous God is, we all fall into this category at some point or another, even as Christians. I, I do it myself. I apply to these. But it says, according to William Barclay, uh, awesome Bible scholar, that the Talmud describes seven different types of Pharisees and six out of the seven are bad. The shoulder Pharisee, who wore all his good deeds and righteousness on his shoulder for everyone to see. People that constantly talk about all the good things that they're doing so that you see their righteousness or you're uh, intimidated by their righteousness. This Pharisee that's like, well, look at all of the awesome things that I do. The wait a little, wait a little Pharisee, who always intends to do good deeds, but could always find a reason for doing them later and not right now. Right? They're talking about all the good that they will do, but they never actually do it and get around to it. The bruised or bleeding Pharisee, he who is so holy that he would turn his head away from any woman seen in public and was therefore constantly bumping into things and tripping, thus injuring himself. Men should keep their eyes to themselves. There's nothing wrong with looking at admiring God's beauty. But where's the line between admiring something that's beautiful and coveting something? Because there's a, that fine line is sin. Right? But these guys would, well, I won't even look at another woman. I won't do this. I won't do that. And they're you know, bumping into things because they're trying to appear so holy. There's nothing wrong with trying to keep your eyes in the right place, your heart in the right place. 
I do that. I'm, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I can admire God's beauty. I can look around and be like, wow, that woman is beautiful. And we can we watch shows and we can say that. But I have to be careful. I'm a guy. I, I, I don't like to look at her and go, oh, she is really beautiful. Like, wow, really, really. And like then you're this lingering looking. You know, when I teach the CRD guys, they're like, well, how long can you look? And I'm like, okay, in essence, your question is you should not look anywhere, right? Because you're already into the trouble trouble point. Like, how long can I look at the woman? It's not about how long, man. It's, a, it's about the heart. You guys are beautiful people. I look at all of you and go, man, God's creation. It doesn't matter if you think you're beautiful or not. You are. That's what God sees you as. But if you find me staring at you, and you're, I'm, I'm probably going to look like a creeper, right? right? But I'm not going to run around and bump into the walls constantly and never look at you. I try to... It's not natural for me to look at people in the eyes when I talk. It's really difficult for me. I try to because it's, it's a sign of importance. It's a sign of respect, right? I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying. But it's so hard. So you will, if, you, if you find me looking around, it's because I am so uncomfortable. It's like if you really want to make me uncomfortable, come look, stand right in front of me and look me dead in the eyes when you're talking. Corey, I see you smiling. Don't do that. That'd be really weird. I'll, I'll kiss you. I'll just go in. Holy kiss. <laughs> I'll weird it out first. So, um, so this the appearing holy, right? This 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 bruised or bleeding Pharisee, the humpbacked Pharisee, who was so humbled that he walked bent over and barely lifted his feet so that everyone could see just how humble he was. Oh, it's, I'm so humble. It's such a weight on my back. The always counting Pharisee. The one who was always counting up his good deeds and believed that if he put God that he put God in debt to him for all of the good that he had done. The fearful Pharisee, he who did good because he was terrified that God would strike him with judgment if he did not. So six out of the seven are bad. Is that one the good one? The last one is the God fearing Pharisee who really loves God and did good deeds to please the God he loved. Even the fearful Pharisee is not the good one. I mean, we should do things because we, we want to honor God, not because we want, we're scared of God. God wants us to respect him, but he wants us to do things because we love him and he loves us. Uh, ending in 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. How is he speaking on this authority? Who is this man? He's a son of God. He's God himself. I wanted to gather you like a chick, right? You, like, hey, come under my wing. I'll protect you like a hen does. But you were unwilling. He says, see in 38, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This, this Lord, this Jesus, this man, he came in humility, true humility, to tell us all of these things. We would know him. And as we'll talk about next week, and he's going to bring it up himself, when he comes back again, he does not come in humility. He does not come and say, hey, maybe you've changed your mind. He said, I come back in judgment. I come back saying, it's been long enough. You've had your opportunity, and now we're done. I, um, I hope that's who we all know, right? The righteous king, the humble king. But he, he has no more need of humility when he comes back and returns. He's going to come back and, and avenge all of the hurt and the pain and the suffering that we've been going through on this earth. And he's going to end it. One fell swoop. The king that they expected him to come as, right? Not the humble man on the donkey's colt. Or as the, new king, uh, the King James puts it, the donkey's ass. It's a cooler way to use King James because you get to swear a little bit. It's a... It's a it's, it means baby donkey, right? A colt. A little, he comes on a little baby donkey. He's going to come in on a white horse. The sword, flaming, eyes of fire. 
He's going to be the king that we all have been waiting for. And until he does, man, we have to be considerate of who are we? What, what Pharisees do we fall under? Because we're all guilty of it. I can do that, right? I can think more of myself. And I'm no longer humble when I think more of myself. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. If you have any questions or would like to request prayer, you can visit us online at www.ccquarrant.org. If you're local, come join us for a service at 125 School Road in Charleston, Maine. We want to remind you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Remain armored up, and until next time, grace and peace.